That movie sucked. I kind of liked it. Movie Night Crew Network. Four fully grown, enormous, vicious looking dragons were rearing onto their hind legs inside an enclosure fenced with thick planks of wood, roaring and snorting. Torrents of fire were shooting into the dark sky from their open fanged mouths, 50 feet above the ground on their outstretched necks. There was a silvery blue one with long pointed horns snapping and snarling at the wizards on the ground. A smooth scaled green one, which was writhing and stamping with all its might. A red one with an odd fringe of fine gold spikes around its face, which was shooting mushroom-shaped fire clouds into the air. And a gigantic black one, more lizard-like than the others, which was nearest to them. What's up, potheads? Welcome to the Restricted Section, a show in which a bunch of nerds with potty mouths reread the Harry Potter series for the umpteenth time and discuss the way that the story and its themes have stayed with a generation into adulthood. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't done the reading, don't worry, we did it for you. Here's what we're talking about this week. Chapter 19, The Hungarian Horntail. Wow. (laughs) Okay, so, uh, so Harry's having a bad time. Um, I guess that's just how, like, all of these summaries are going to be starting this book. He's not fucking okay. Um, Rita fucking Skeeter has published a bunch of lies about him, and he's being teased mercilessly. Hagrid shows him that the first Triwizard task is dragons, (laughs) which really doesn't help Harry become more okay. Um, And Sirius pops into the Gryffindor common room fireplace so that they can dish a little bit about Karkarov being a former Death Eater. Um, And Sirius definitely suspects that Voldemort is somehow involved in all this bullshit. Hello from last year. Happy New Year. Welcome to the restricted section where everyone wants to fuck Charlie Weasley. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm honored, nay, blessed to be joined by my youthful friend, Mary Clay. Say hello to the listeners, so, Mary Clay. Okay, well, <coughs> I tested negative literally this afternoon, but I have some kind of an ailment. So the fact that you say youthful and that I'm... Introducing myself with the cough. Christina, I will try to mute my microphone whenever I cough. Hello, everyone, and happy new year. Please, God, tell me 2022 is better than 2021. Don't draw any attention to the changing of the years. (laughs) Does your microphone mute on the microphone? Uh, Why, yes, it does. Oh. Wow, she's demonstrating. (laughs) She's continuing to demonstrate. There we go. I couldn't unmute it. I clicked it two times and it wouldn't unmute. That's amazing because these recordings are full of people who very politely muted the Zoom call. And then when I'm editing it, it's like when they blow their nose and I'm like, God, sometimes it startles me. Keeps me on my toes. Anyway, I'm super stoked because our special guest today is Nick Zakarowitz, crushed it, word nerd, and Nick hails from podcasts like Fanthropological and the Nick's cast. Say hello to the listeners, Nick. Hey, all you listeners out there in restricted section land. We call them the detention crew because we're like mm. the bad kids. We go to the restricted section. We went to section. the restricted section. We got detention. Ooh. Forever. But also, like, what, the, like, of all the things to get detention for at Hogwarts, it's like, congratulations, you went to the part of the library you're not supposed to go to. Yeah. <laughs> and that, if that isn't the main theme of this podcast, I don't know what is. It's like, yeah, we swear, but we're swearing about Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nick, tell us a little bit about your very Harry history. Like, mm-hmm. when did you read the books? If you did, when did you watch the movies? If you did, what's up? It's It's a little bit of a blur. I mean, I think... Honestly, I think my first introduction to the series uh, was when my younger brother started to pick up the books. So for the first maybe three, maybe up to the fourth book, the very book we're about to talk about a part of, Mm -hmm. um, it kind of had that, you know, uncool little brother is into this kind of kind of vibe to it for me. Yeah. Um, But then like the books, (laughs) the books got bigger and bigger. So obviously more and more serious. Right, they're for grown-ups now. Absolutely, absolutely. Have you seen those covers very artfully with just, just a goblet against a back background? And, uh, oh, 
forget about it. Um, yes. But the movies also came out and like got bigger and bigger and I want to say better and better. Yeah. But I mean, definitely the child acting got better and better. Yeah. 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 So I think I, I slid into the series a little bit more through the movies than the books. Mm-hmm. But then at least, if not from the Goblet of Fire, then from the next one, Order of the Phoenix, if I remember uh, properly, mm-hmm. um, that's when I started to read them. Awesome. And that's yeah. when the books kind of become really, yeah, like complex and like nuanced and some yeah. adult themes. Yeah. So is there a Hogwarts house that you identify with more than the others? Ravenclaw. Oh, yeah. We we attract a lot of Ravenclaws here on <laughs> <Yep>. this podcast. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? A podcast about Harry Potter attracts a bunch of Ravenclaws? What? It's so weird that all my friends who like to read are Ravenclaws. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cool. It's always good to have a Ravenclaw on the podcast. I personally am a Hufflepuff. Mary Clay's a Slytherin, so it's good to have balance. (laughs) Absolutely. If it were just me, we did one episode that was all Hufflepuffs. We covered the fan play Puffs, and that, you know, it definitely had a tone. I'm just insulted I was not invited to that. How dare you? (laughs) I brought all Puffs on that episode. Oh, so glorious. What a great show. So before we get to the chapter, uh, I have... mm, a fan email. Um, mm-hmm. This is from our pod sib, Zach, from over on My Cabbages and Avatar The Last Airbender podcast, which is one of our sibling podcasts on the Movie Night Crew Network. So if you like Avatar and you haven't checked them out, please do. Um, the cabbage part is important context for what is to come because Zach says, sup fam, it's your boy and cabbage farmer, Zach. <laughs> I didn't want to just throw the cabbage farmer <laughs> out there with no context. Have, just no context. <laughs> it would have thrown me for a loop, yeah. <laughs> Um, with a question I wanted to get your take on. In the Prisoner of Azkaban movie, parentheses, you know, the best one. We can debate that later. <laughs> when they change Pettigrew back into a human being in the Shrieking Shack, he appears stuck in the wall and fully clothed. Later, when he makes his escape, he transforms into a rat and his clothes fall around know. him. I don't have what an gives? answer. I don't have what an gives? answer. What gives? <laughs> Do Anna May Gauss and very... The words animagi. An, 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 <laughs> or um, if you listen to the audiobook, it's um, Jim Dale, that's it. He goes like, animagi or something. Uh, that is <laughs> extremely British and pretentious. <laughs> Do animagus always change back in their clothes? Could they use this like a Minecraft duplication glitch to get 50 pairs of suede pants? I feel like this exploit could completely destabilize the wizarding the wizard economy. Also, maybe that's why it took Sirius so long to defend the game from Lupin. I'm depe- I'm picturing a big black dog behind the Whomping Willow struggling to unbutton a heavy cloak. <laughs> <laughs> How do Animagus work? What about their clothes? I need to understand with like five A's. <laughs> Keep making great pod nerds with lots of love and cabbages, Zach. Zach, thank you so much for the the email, even though it makes me mad because it doesn't make any sense. The thing is, is that I don't think we can take that example as like the canon example for how in a, in a, now I'm all in my head about (laughs) Animagus's act because he also uses a wand and it's the Mm -hmm. only time that you see someone use a wand to transform themselves back into their animal form. It is very silly. And so... I don't know if that implication was that, like, maybe Sirius and Remus put some kind of, you know, charm on him so that he couldn't change back. And then he got the wand to, um, ch- to like, remove the charm first. And that's how his clothes came off. I don't know. But, like, that's me filling in a lot of holes there that we don't see on screen. So I wouldn't take that mm-hmm. example of Pettigrew in the movie changing back into a, a rat to heart. I do like the joke, though, about it destabilizing the wizard economy. Yes. Just, yes. You, well, no, because I think if you, I think the next time Peter transforms back into a man, I think at that point he would be naked. Because <laughs> he lost all his clothes. Like, his little, because, like, when he turns into a rat, like, he doesn't appear in, like, a little rat oh. size <laughs> three-piece what suit, he, you know? Oh, my God, what if he did, like, Stuart Little? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god um yeah i, I think i, I don't think, think that is a, the solution to yeah. this conundrum is is like animal clothing <laughs> maybe that was okay. part of the charm of uh 
or not the charm of, but maybe that was part of whatever spell had potentially been cast on him in the first place, right? It, it cut him off from that extra bit of animal clothing. So <laughs> he had to like shed not just his human clothes when he changed back into a rat, but his animal, his rat clothes too. Oh my god, this is getting very like hard for me to keep track of. Like, where's the like, where's the magic and where's the clothing? Maybe they're maybe they're more linked than we think, and that's really the solution to the whole conundrum. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> it was about the clothes all along. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, well, let's get to the chapter. We are talking today about chapter 19 of Goblet of Fire, the Hungarian Horntail. Woo! Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, we meet the Hungarian Horntail in this episode, gang. <laughs> um, it starts with, I, I think that the last chapter also started this way with just, like, an anxiety montage. <laughs> I've already forgotten how, like, I literally read it, like, two hours ago, and I'm like, I don't know how it opens. It's just a whole chapter of Harry... Being, being like, simply do not perceive me. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But, um, yeah. So he is stressed about the first task. He doesn't know what it is. He's being teased mercilessly. Rita fucking Skeeter publishes her yeah. piece about the Triwizard Tournament. This is when I think the books, I mean, not that they haven't been, but like when Rita Skeeter is introduced, it gets a lot more, even though you hate her and she's annoying, the like, I don't know, wit and the the shenanigans and the tomfoolery that she introduces to the plot, I think is really fun and enjoyable to like read her absolutely terrible, <laughs> you know, propaganda, whatever articles and to hear it like. Like even like you hear Molly's reaction being like, "Oh poor dear, he still cries." And Molly's <laughs> having kittens is the exact quote. Molly's having kittens about Harry, Aww. which I love. That let's bring that back. Yeah, I really like Rita Skeeter. Um, I also really like in this book Ludo Bagman. I think they're both um, examples of how the book series is maturing by introducing characters that aren't bad guys, but they're just shitty people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> It's like, wow, you're almost worse than the villain. You're doing a lot of damage willingly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just that sort of, that, that everyday villainy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, the article she publishes is all about Harry. Fleur and Crumb are only mentioned in the last line of this three-page article, and Cedric is not mentioned at all. Poor Cedric. <laughs> yeah. The Hufflepuff. <laughs> He's got a great attitude. <laughs> He's probably like, I didn't want the attention anyway. <laughs> but you better believe Amos Diggory is fucking livid. Oh, Amos, poor dude. <laughs> I know, I can't I can't think of him. <laughs> yeah, also Rita Skeeter like invented a lot of quotes like, yeah, I still cry about my parents all the time. Like I'm actively weeping right now, like etc. Yeah. That um that happened to me once in a yearbook. Um, one of my friends was on the yearbook staff and she was doing the layout for the spring musical and there was a picture of me in it. And then the caption was like, Mary Clay Watts says about her big solo, it was really hard to do, but once I pre and like made up this quote that I said, <laughs> I have been known to do that, but like only like, for example, I recently wrote a press release for like my business launch and I made up quotes for my business partners. <laughs> I know because I know that they would rather me make up the quote for them than have to do it themselves, you know? What a reputable way to begin your business <laughs> endeavor together. I can't be the one who wrote it is the email contact and did all the quotes. Like well, there have to be other people in this business. <laughs> User power for good, not evil. So Rita fucking Skeeter also insinuates that Harry and Hermione are together. Don't ship living humans and definitely not children. That's yeah. like so uncomfortable for them. Yeah, I was, I mean, it would have made it a little bit too busy maybe, but I, I was kind of surprised that more wasn't made out of that. I think it escalates. Yeah, okay. I think, I think this is like the one where they're like, LOL, that's stupid. At least Hermione, luckily, like, is like, that's pretty stupid. But, like, it, it gets worse. Like, in the, in this book or just 
it yeah, gets, okay. it gets it, okay. it escalates. It gets to the point where Molly Weasley is like livid at Hermione <laughs> because of Rita fucking Skeeter. <laughs> yeah, it's actually quite fun, but like in in all reality, for a fourteen year old, yeah, uh, like different gender, uh, like heterosexual friendship, this is a fucking nightmare. Yeah, I just if someone had come up to me and my like my best friend when we were 14 and been like, oh my God, you guys look so cute together. You should date. I think I would have died on the spot. <laughs> I am 26 years old. <laughs> my mom still does this to this day. Espe- like even regarding some of my male friends that are married. And I'm like, <laughs> Ooh, mom, <laughs> mom, oh, wow. those jokes. And cu- cause I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm going over to so-and-so's house. And she'll be like, is that a boy? And I'm like, yes. And you know who's also going to be there? His wife. <laughs> She's going to get you in <laughs> like, trouble and there someday. Twenty children <laughs> and their five dogs and cats. You know, and the house that they own together and pay a mortgage together. You know. <laughs> and I did finally have to say, it's me, it was my house. Be really firm with her and be like, I know you say that jokingly, but it's very annoying and it's inappropriate and you need to stop and she was like okay okay and i'm like like i offended her (laughs) dude parents do be that way i i i very recently had to tell my dad you know making like casual racist jokes is like not funny we're not laughing with you no one's listening and yeah it definitely was like uh i offended him you know (laughs) yeah just because you born to me doesn't mean that you know better yes (laughs) Um, so Harry gets, like, so sick of the tea. Like, people are tease- actively teasing him whenever he's, like, on the move in the hall. And, like, it gets to a point where someone's like, hey, Harry. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm just off to cry about my fucking dead parents again. And it's just, it's Cho Chang. And she's like, oh, sorry, you dropped your quill. I love sassy, <laughs> angsty Harry. <sighs> It's, like, extra good because Cho, like, Harry obviously is extremely awkward, but Cho is also nightmarishly awkward. Like, if Harry had pulled this move on, for example, Luna Lovegood, it would have ended completely differently. (laughs) He would have had a friend at the end of that encounter. She would have been like, do you need to talk about something? (laughs) Cho's just like, oh, God, I'm out of here. More montage stuff. We're hanging out with Hermione. Um, having Hermione as his bestie is starting to wear on Harry a little bit. He's real sad about mm-hmm. it. <laughs> yeah, they hang out in the library a lot. And he always, he like stays in the narrative being like, Ron would love this. <laughs> Just go make up with him. Like they're, Unless, like, like they're, a, you know, him. a couple. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like boyfriend, Almost. boyfriend, broken up couple. <laughs> It's like when I go on vacation with my gal pals and I'm like, oh, Sean would really like this. Which doesn't happen a lot because I usually go on hiking trips with my gal pals and Sean would not really like this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they hang out in the library a lot. And like so weird, Victor Crumb is like always there. Um, I guess he just really likes books. Yeah. Or perhaps people who like books. <gasps> da 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 Man, like, the notion that a man would, like, spend so much time in a library just because he liked me is, is like... That's so hot. Ridiculous. <laughs> I don't even know if it's hot. It's just, like, unfathomable. <laughs> it's, it's like, the ideal... It's, like, a Hallmark movie meet cute of, like... <laughs> Of like, I I don't know how to approach this girl that I think is cute, but she comes to the library all the time. So I'm going to go to the library, but I'm never going to say anything to her. (laughs) And then one day, maybe you both have books in your arms and you're bringing them back to the bookshelf. And then, oh, no, I bumped into you and all my books went everywhere. And then that's how the, the Hallmark movie begins. Yeah. Wow. I love that. You should write that. I'm good. Actually, I'm sure. I'm sure. Are you kidding me? I'm sure Hallmark has already written it. <laughs> You're probably right about that. I've definitely read a couple books where they fall in love at a bookstore. Book people like books. I don't know. It's yeah, weird. it's true. <laughs> people who write, read and write books like to think that that hobby could yeah. get them somewhere. It's like when I go to Barnes and Noble and I browse and I'm like, Lo- like wistfully like running my finger across the book spines being like oh is there a cute boy noticing me <laughs> meanwhile I'm all like hunched over and like my head is turned to the side because all the books are on their side so I'm trying to read the title uh, yes I have a mask on 
it's not a cute situation at all. No boy is looking at me. I usually end up on the floor. Like, I get to a section I really like, and I, like, sit down, and I'm like, I need a minute, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, everything, sometimes the best stuff is on the bottom shelf, right? Like, It's mm-hmm. true. That's definitely true of wine, for sure. And by best stuff, I mean the most affordable stuff. <laughs> Um, my friends Maggie and Sarah, their first date was at a bookstore, and then they Sarah proposed to Maggie in a bookstore. <laughs> That's so fucking cute! Oh my god! I know. I have to remind myself that Hermione does not end up with Victor Crumb. <laughs> no. Nor should she, but it's fun for her to feel very, like, girly and adored for a book or two, you know? But she's, a, she, right now, she's very oblivious She's like, right. why does he keep coming in here? Like, does he even know how to read? Like, he's not even that good looking. <laughs> that is valid because he could not know how to read English, which would make yeah. this year of schooling a nightmare. I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't even get in again into like the logistics of schooling the Durmstrang and Bobaton gang. Like, what? That's so true. Like, if the magic yeah. schools aren't teaching them, like, a lot of. Um, a lot of European schools do teach English as a second language, yeah. um, and most people in Europe know English as a second language. But like, if the magical schools like aren't even teaching math, you know, <sighs> I doubt that they're teaching. You know, in, in the non-English speaking magic schools, I doubt there's a you know English class option. But <laughs> yeah, well, but there's got to be a spell for that, right? Like, you just point at a book Ooh. and it just turns to the language i was thinking that i was thinking about in hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy they have like the babble fish that they introduce like right away it's like a fish that swims into your brain mm-hmm. and translates stuff for you and it's like is it a good a good explanation no but like it serves <laughs> its purpose throughout the entire story and like mm-hmm. they definitely could i think just like write a simple spell because like yeah why would all these people know how to speak very good english yeah. Um, they do that in the the good place where, like, in the first episode when Eleanor meets Chidi and he's like, "Oh, I'm from Senegal," and she's like, "Well, how are you speaking English right now?" And he's like, "Oh, I'm actually speaking f- like I'm speaking French." Oh yeah, but it must sound like English to you, and so they just you know <laughs> use this like afterlife you know world explanation to to like send that away, you know? Right. That explanation being. Magic, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would have been cute if they had acknowledged that here, but they don't. So he's just pretending to read English in the library for days on end. <laughs> so the Saturday before the first task, we still have no idea what the first task is. And it's a Hogsmeade weekend. They they can all go to Hogsmeade. And Harry's like, I'll go, but I insist on wearing my invisibility cloak. And here's my note for this, Mary Clay, you alluded to this earlier. Sometimes when I'm having like a really bad mental health day, I say like, I don't want to be perceived right now. Like, I don't want to be seen. Sean's like, what can I do to help? And I'm like, go as far away away. (laughs) as you can. (laughs) Don't look at me. leave me. (laughs) Don't acknowledge me. (laughs) Yeah. And like, damn, it would be really nice to have an invisibility cloak. (laughs) Yeah. Because then you can go still run your, you can still run errands. If you really yeah, wanted self checkout, yeah, yeah, <laughs> ma'am, the self checkout is open. No, it's not. There's someone here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, that could be a little awkward. Yeah, <laughs> they say in this book that like uh, it's like awkward wearing the invisibility cloak in a crowd because you might step on someone and it leads to awkward questions. But I'm actually proofreading a book right now. Um, And it's funny that I read these two things on the same day. But the girl in the book uh, that I'm proofreading goes invisible. And she's like, it's really fun and easy to be invisible in a crowd because there's so many people. Nobody notices that there's like a missing, Mm. that there's like elbows where there shouldn't be. You know what I mean? Like, which one do you guys think it would be? Is the book that you're proofreading right now by a North American author? Yes. I think it might be a cultural thing. Because, like, when oh, I imagine, when I imagine, like, an English crowd, I mean, following stereotypes and whatever, I imagine kind oh, of an more orderly, polite. polite crowd, right? Oh, my God. Like, that if is you a bump, great If you were point. to bump into someone, yeah. you might turn around and say, oh, I'm sorry. But yeah. maybe the implication is that in America, people won't even, like... It's just everyone's <laughs> twice. elbowing you. Or especially, like, if the setting in your book that you were reading was, like, New York, yeah. you know? 
Yeah. It wasn't. It was like a fantasy town square, so it was like kind of a similar vibe. Yeah, so. But um, it was more of like, this is like uh, almost like the pre-Christmas like hustle and bustle, but what I was proofreading was a bit of like a like a mo- like a borderline mob scene so definitely oh, wow. the ca- okay so these are some great points so these are entirely different scenarios is what we're getting at yeah i think so anyway i just think that if i had an invisibility c- cloak in a crowd like i don't think i don't think it would be that hard to like not be really awkward and obvious like you would just kind of like duck around and if you look really yeah. weird doing it it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah as long as the cloak doesn't like open up on the elbow or your hand doesn't slide out or something like that (laughs) what i think is hilarious is that like it mentions when they're like like they're leaving honey dukes i think they have they either have like ice cream or candy or something yeah Mm -hmm. and and then later on it mentions that hermione gives harry a butterbeer like under his cloak and just like i don't know what it is but just the Mm -hmm. idea of like being under a blanket and like licking an ice cream cone (laughs) or like drinking a beer (laughs) you would have to like use your other hand to make like a little bit of a visor for yourself Mm -hmm. yeah like have room yeah it would be really sticky i would probably get really mad and end up like shucking the whole thing does harry ever wash the invisibility (laughs) and my i don't think he does this on my theory is that much like (laughs) college boys and their duvets or their duvet <laughs> covers, or a comforter, or whatever you call it. It never gets washed. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they do their own laundry here, and a house elf who mm. c- collects the laundry isn't going to be like, let me take this invisible object. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out that it's a good thing that he wore the cloak, because they see Rita fucking Skeeter right away, and like, man, fuck that bitch. <laughs> Every time I see her, She's I'm looking like, for a scoop, you yeah. see? <laughs> Rita Skeeter is ten times funnier if you just imagine her as like a night in like a nineteen twenties like New York reporter. Like I'm looking for a hot fresh scoop. Where <laughs> on the double? <laughs> like the uh, like the episode recaps from Legend of Korra. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do like that. At, at least like. I would like it better if she, act, like, she acts so, like, saccharine and, like, but, like, if she just acted like a skeezy reporter, that could be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um. So they go into the three broomsticks for some butterbeer. Hermione, okay, Hermione is working on some SPEW stuff, also known as spew, and Harry asks when she's going to give it up. I'm so sorry. What the fuck did you just say to her? When are you going to stop trying to liberate the people who Nassles, are apparently yeah. love being enslaved so much <laughs> that they don't even know that they're enslaved? I can't believe, like, how unsupportive he is in this moment. Like, I've never in my life... I mean, maybe when I was an extremely shitty person trying to get up to some shenanigans in high school or something, but, like, I've never in my life had a friend turn to me and be like, when are you going to give up on that one dream you have? <laughs> like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's rough. I mean, the way that the way that it's written, it seems like it reminded me a lot of how uh, Lisa Simpson is treated on The Simpsons. I don't know if it's still the case, but like definitely in the 90s and early aughts where it's all about making fun of Lisa's beliefs. That is like a really good comparison to draw. I, I when you as soon as you said that, I was thinking about um, Lois Griffin a little bit too. Oh, yeah. Just like these like nagging. Ooh, I've got, I've like, got another m- one for y'all. Um, hmm. Emma Nelson on Degrassi. Oh my god, I don't know that reference. Always <laughs> but somebody ha- will. Someone listening will. She <laughs> uh, and this was like, you know, like early 2000s. So like I, I feel like that's when like having a TV character who was like into the environment mm-hmm. is, you know, oh, was all the rage, I guess. That was like an, a character like choice a trope, at that point. You know? <laughs> um, and so Emma Nelson always has some kind of cause that she's like trying to get signatures for a petition or starting a club about. And it like gets really annoying throughout the entire series <laughs> oh that sucks and that's like a narrative lens right like these people could be doing these things in a way that's like productive and respected um but they're not the narrative this like when harry says when are you going to give this up that's the narrative of this book being like this dumb bitch she needs to give this up what does she say she says like when the elves have you know suitable wages and yeah. right working Holidays. conditions yeah. And 
so here's here's two ways that I now interpret the spew plot line as an adult. There's the lens now of being like, you know, like reading it growing up or when I was younger, reading it and Harry and Ron and everyone else is ragging on it. You're like, oh, yeah, of course, we don't need spew like the elves like being house elves. That's cool. But now as an adult, you're like, really, JK? Like, what a weird thing to write that, like, the enslaved people like being slaves. And, you know, and, like, what a weird thing to do. And, of course, Hermione should be doing this cause. Right. The Mm -hmm. other perspective, though, is that when you are trying to help a group of people in need, you, what's in, what can happen a lot of times is that you... As the person in a privileged position, a lot of times you can think, well, I know what they need. They need suitable wages and these living conditions rather than going to the group of people who you are trying to help and say, what do you need? You know, what do you actually need from me? And there's instances of people like trying to go, you know, help destitute villages in Africa. And they bring like they build like a school building. But they don't give any, like, school supplies. Or they don't, yeah. like, what they really needed was, like, access to clean water, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I saw this analogy somewhere, and I'm sorry that I don't remember, like, where this was. You know, the internet. But I saw this analogy where this guy was talking about, like, this kind of thing. And the analogy he used is that, like, his mother-in-law, like, did not, uh, like, let him help her cook in the kitchen for years. He had to, like, stand there and, like, chit-chat with her and watch her cook in the kitchen for, like, years. Before she was like, okay, come here, you can help with this little thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's really about, like, observing and understanding and gaining trust, you know? And so Hermione is doing advocacy the way that fucking J.K. Rowling would probably have done advocacy, you know? Just like, well, look at me. Like, I'm trying to make a difference. And it's like, like, do it different. When she does eventually, like, go talk to the house elves and they're like, no, we like working here. Like, Hogwarts is a great place to work. And, you know, all of a sudden, like, Winky's really depressed because she got fired. And Hermione just doesn't listen to them. And it's like, no, girl, like, this is the group of people you're trying to help. You can't be like, well, they don't know what they're talking about, you know? Right. It's not as simple as like, well, they're silly. Whatever. Yeah. We can't harp on this too much. It is um, it is very depressing the way – what she really needs – and honestly, when I was in high school, you could not form a club uh, without a, a teacher sponsor. Like, you needed a teacher supervising it. And, like, what Hermione needs is a teacher yeah yeah to be like let's do it this way here's some resources maybe spew isn't the final name we settle on that's a great thing to think about more i can't believe she landed on that either what does it stand for (laughs) the society for the protection of elvish welfare like call it anything else (laughs) i bet i could come up with a better name right now Um, go um i mean you put yourself on the spot Okay, I'm going to call. <laughs> okay, the first thing that came to mind was Ho, H O E, help our elves. <laughs> Love it. I mean, I have to tell you, though, if the teacher, um, you know, administrator is not going to approve Spew, I don't think they will approve Ho. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. It was bad, but the thing is that you keep brainstorming. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you keep brainstorming. Yeah. So Harry's just sitting around brooding. He's like, fuck Hermione and her dreams. What if she had to fight? Uh, What if she had to do a contest? And like, I have to do this contest and I'm just so sad. Hagrid and Mad-Eye Moody show up and Mad-Eye Moody alerts Hagrid to Harry's presence as his magical eye can see through the invisibility cloak. His magic eye can see through death's own cloak, I guess. Yeah, I feel like that shouldn't be allowed. I could get him seeing through like the knockoff invisibility cloaks you know yeah. that are charmed but like of course i feel like that shouldn't be allowed <laughs> <laughs> do we know where he got that eye from <laughs> i feel like i don't want to know <laughs> that's pretty creepy yeah yeah because like at least it, i don't know what it looks like i don't know what it looks like in the book you know i don't know mm-hmm. what jk was imagining when she wrote that he has this magical eye 
But in the movies, it's very like robotic and mechanical, yeah. which yeah. is very much like you don't unless it was like maybe Arthur Weasley. He does. Yes. He does mess <laughs> with the car. You know, <laughs> you don't really imagine like a wizard sitting at their desk, like fooling around with like mechanics and engineering, you know. Right. Yeah. I, I think that in that stuff like inherently doesn't work with magic. So you're right that it is weird. It's not described as mechanical in the books. It's just like a big, creepy, blue ass eye staring at you. Yeah, I think it's like the main thing that makes it that his eyes creepy is like the juxtaposition because one is small and dark and beady and the other one is like big and open and like very fast and blue Gross. and apparently more powerful than death. death. Yeah. <laughs> I hate everything about that. <laughs> Hagrid is like, <laughs> you can tell that he's like very chuffed to be like in on the secret. He's like, hey, he's like, he's like, oh, what's up, Hermione? Harry, meet me at my house at midnight. Oh, great to see you, Hermione. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> Just Hermione. No one else at this table. <laughs> oh, Hagrid come to my cabin at midnight. So Harry has like stacking mysterious nighttime rendezvous because he's also supposed to meet with Sirius Black at 1 a.m. in the common room. So Hermione's like, don't, I mean, and I definitely would have taken this position. Like, don't do that. Whatever Hagrid needs you for, do it tomorrow. <laughs> like you have, the serious thing is like pretty important. But Harry's like, I, I can do it. <laughs> Actually, once we see these two events happen like obviously leading up to it harry is more excited to see sirius because he's having a real shitty time and yeah. sirius is his daddy now and he hasn't seen <laughs> him in several months and so even just like like sirius is obviously not going to be able to solve this whole tri wizard tournament thing but like even just seeing and talking to him harry's like that's going to make me feel better um but Sometimes you just need your person. After both of these events happen, I would argue that the Hagrid thing was much more important because all Sirius does is be like, hey, you better watch out. A bunch of people want to kill you. <laughs> Surprise. Okay. But also, when Hagrid is like, hey, Hermione, and then it whispers and he's like, Harry, come to my house at midnight. You know what he could do? He could be like, hey, bud, the first task is dragons. Yeah. And then, I don't, and then walk away. Yeah. <laughs> I think possibly he was thinking if he like he could say he didn't do anything it's like well how is i supposed to know that harry showed up to my house at the exact time wearing his invisibility cloak followed me into the like he just happened to see the dragons mm. that's not my fault you know yeah and he like barely acknowledges harry during that whole ordeal so like that's pr a pretty valid point i mean he definitely intentionally shows the <laughs> The enemy. Whenever I say that word, I think about, isn't it in Lord of the Rings where it's like the enemy with a capital E yeah. throughout? I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally is. That's what I always picture. The enemy. It's Madame Maxime. <laughs> yeah, so Harry sneaks out um, before midnight to go down to Hagrid's. He's wearing his invisibility cloak. He probably just like lives in that thing these days. Do not perceive like me. Like I said, he doesn't wash it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. He's just like eating pop darts in it. It's so disgusting. <laughs> The creepy but brothers, Colin and Dennis, are in the common room. I just love this detail. They're trying to fix the support Cedric Diggory slash Potter Stinks badges, but so far they've only managed to get them stuck on Potter Stinks. I think um, it's really cute if you imagine them as they're thinking, we're going to be the next Fred and George. Oh, oh shut up. Isn't that cute? Shut up. And then one of them I dies. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> wait, that's true of Fred and George, too. Oh, no. Shut oh, up. what a fun time. Anyway. But wait, like, wait, wait, wait. But what? So that means George and Dennis need to team up, yeah, right? I think so. Mm. I think George should have reached out to Dennis <laughs> after the war and been like, hey, why don't you come work in the joke shop? Oh, my God. Christina's crying. Listeners, I made her cry. Sobbing. <laughs> Just, like, honestly, like, Fred is the death that hit me the hardest. I think it's That's really so rude to take away a twin. It's just awful is what it is. Yeah. It's awful. It is bad. Um, I don't approve of it. For me, that was uh, 
Keely and Feely in oh, The shut Hobbit. Up. Especially when you're reading it. Because it's like Thorin has this death scene, and then afterwards they're all like reconnecting so after the battle. Bilbo's, the book is almost 100 years old, so I think it's fun. Up I until yeah. recently, yeah. I was the only one who did not know anything about it. Yeah, um, we used to have a Lord of the Rings spoiler policy only because of you, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no one tell me about the Soviet Lord of the Rings. I told Don't. you it's a fucking fever dream. I That's watched the, the whole I watched summary. the Soviet Hobbit. It was mm-hmm. interesting. Anyway, and you're reading the Hobbit after the battle's over, and then it's like, and Bilbo gathered up all his things, and Balin gave him a share of the treasure, and blah, blah, blah. And also Keely and Feely died, and then Bilbo went home, and it's like, excuse me, you can't slip that one in. <laughs> and then Bilbo went home. That's how much of a shit he gave about that. <laughs> Um, I like how when Harry's when he's going to leave to go down to Hagrid's, Hermione almost I imagine it's reminiscent of like Hagrid earlier in the Three Broomsticks. Like they set it up where like Hermione walks into the common room just as Harry needs to walk out so that the door opens um, without anyone, um, which like Harry could easily just like walk out and put the cloak on later, you know? Yeah. Doesn't want to be perceived. The creavies would have gotten him. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I just love that they set it up and then Hermione's like, good luck or whatever on the way out. <laughs> I don't know, like, if Hermione was like stalling in the hallway outside or something, like that that kind of business, like, I don't know how you do that without a phone. Like, I don't know if you've ever been walking and realized you're walking in the wrong direction and had to turn around. Oh, I yeah. always, I always like doing a lot. I don't know if anyone's watching, but like, I always do like an elaborate, like, let me check my phone. Oh, no, I've clearly received new information. Yes. And like, now I'm turning around. Why do we do that? Or like, if I was, if I was Hermione trying to stall outside the portrait, I'm like, oh, it's not quite time to let Harry in yet. I would. Do like a fake phone. I do fake phone calls all the time when I don't want my neighbors to speak to me. And like, how do you do that without a phone? Like, what is she doing? Maybe she's talking to the portrait. Oh my God. She would actually. How's your day? Do you need to be liberated? (laughs) Oh my God. Oh my God. She sets the portraits free. (laughs) Oh my God. Chaos. Oh, that reminds me that, um, Earlier, Hermione is like, you should send a note with Hedwig down to Hagrid and say, I, you know, I don't want to come um, and or like, I'll come another time. <laughs> Fuck and, you, I don't want to come. And it has the note like with Hedwig's consent to carry the message, of course. And it may have been in a pre- maybe in a previous chapter or something where like. Hedwig is mad at Harry. Hedwig's for some been reason. mad at Harry. Okay, yeah. okay, that's Hedwig's it. Been but mad yeah, at I Harry. just thought it was really like reading that, you know, slightly out of context, being like, this is the one time consent is mentioned uh, from other creatures, you know, as being important. No, yeah, he like, um, Hedwig was gone. Okay, he- okay, this book started with Hedwig being gone for like a long time. Mm. And then um, she came back and he immediately sent her out with another letter for Sirius about his, the cha- about chapter one, like his scar hurting from the dream. She's gone for so long because he's in like fucking like Chile or something. Like we don't know where he is. And so she's gone for like weeks. And when she finally shows up, She's, like, hanging out. She's, like, I did it. I did the thing. I brought your letter. And he's, like, so mad about the contents of the letter that he yells at her. And she fucks off through the open window and, like, doesn't talk to him, doesn't engage. And a couple weeks later, I don't don't know how much time passes, but he goes up. He's, like, I need to send a, a letter to Sirius again. He goes up and she's, like, she's, like, well... I'm mad at you, but, like, I'm a professional, and I'll still deliver this letter. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, actually, I can't send you to Sirius anymore because you're too hot boy. You're like a white owl. And she's like, well, fuck you. I didn't want to deliver this letter anyway. (laughs) And so that's where we're at in the whole Hedwig debacle. Oh, poor Hedwig. At this time. (laughs) I love her. Um, yeah, so Harry goes down to Hagrid's hut. Hagrid is all dolled up. He tried to comb his hair. <laughs> Emphasis on tried. He's wearing his suit, right? It, his nasty suit. He's just, uh, whatever. Um, he needs, he needs the Fab Five. He needs oh Queer my- Eye. Oh. 
That would be great. Oh my god, just yeah. picture Jonathan Venice being like, oh, look at my little big baby. We're gonna get you all dolled up. <laughs> and I love that I love this gorgeous, gorgeous hair you have. But I'm gonna show you how you can tame it and maintain it in a way that is flattering on your face. And we're not gonna shave <laughs> your beard, don't worry, because I love a bear daddy moment, but <laughs> Jonathan opens like his bathroom drawer, sees like 17 broken combs and just makes eye contact with the camera. <laughs> um, so Hagrid's like, come on. And Harry's like, OK, this is extremely weird. Hagrid goes to the Bobaton's carriage where he picks up Madame Maxine. And Harry's like, what am I about to witness? <laughs> Harry, I think this is one of those moments where Harry is like, I cannot fathom one single even slightly reasonable explanation for what is going on right now like i'm on a date with these guys right now in the movie it's really cute because you see harry under the cloak as they're talking and like being flirty or whatever you see harry like stick his tongue out yeah he's like that's exactly what a 14 year old boy would do it's really cute (laughs) Yeah, Madame Maxine is is laying it on thick, you know. Oh, Agrid, where are you taking oh, me? Oh, also he says, um, oh, what does he say? <laughs> Sorry, I got, I've been playing with my headphone cord in my hand. <laughs> <It's> totally. <laughs> she was just trying to get her book and was, was tangled in a it. lot of stuff. Um, oh, oh, he says bong sewer. Oh, yeah, bong sewer. Which I'm assuming <laughs> is supposed to be bonsoir. Yeah. Bonsoir. Bong sewer. That might have been the first time in my life my eyes ever saw the word bong, bong. typed out. <laughs> bong sewer. That's what happens if you don't change your water often enough. <laughs> this is a PSA, PSA to all my smokers out there. Change your bong water immediately. Okay. So they're like walking around the perimeter of the Forbidden Forest. Um. Okay. It's dragons. what what's just what incredible build up to that moment i thought there's more and then you're like it's dragons it's dragons um the book is also kind of that way like the book is like they were walking like harry was confused and they kept walking and then they turned a corner and it was dragons dragons. yep it is four massive angry dragons they're, they're enraged because they're all nesting mothers. First of all, that is the maddest kind of anything you could get is a, a nesting mother. And they were like, the games department was like, yeah, we want these for these children. <laughs> and like, here's the thing. Like, y'all know how government works. Like, someone like Charlie Weasley, like or, a Charlie Weasley or similar, like, got, got an owl opened the letter and the letter was like, hey man, we need you to bring four nesting mothers of different breeds to Britain. And and was like, uh, I guess we're doing this now. <laughs> Question, just since we're talking about, you know, like the, the dangers of the dragons and stuff. And um, I haven't been on for a chapter since Harry's name was pulled out of the goblet. Have we discussed like, why, why can Harry just not be like, no. I'm I'm good. Like, why does he ha- like? Does he die if he doesn't participate in the tasks? Well, you see, it's magically binding. <laughs> no, but like, what does that mean? But like, well, like you'll what never is- have to know because you're bound magically. <laughs> but yeah. like, but like, why can't he? Why can't they just have him? Like, let's say he's magically bound to the goblet and has to participate in all the tasks. Why can't they just be like? Harry walks on to the first ta- the the like grounds of the first task and then is like oh no I give up and then turns around you know like why does he have to participate you know I don't I don't think you understand that there are rules <laughs> but and, what and are they <laughs> you know well, it just really we made me mad them. we don't have to know them because Barty Crouch knows them and there he's that's magically binding but yeah, that's, that's but all that matters how but why? It's, it's magic via <laughs> magic. If it sounds like I'm trolling oh, you, it's because it's I am. And this are. makes no fucking sense. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, they they do mention quite a few, a few times that in previous Triwizard tournaments, a lot of people have died. Maybe those people died because they broke the contract. 
Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's like the only thing, but it doesn't make any sense. But like the way that they describe this magic to me feels like blood magic. Um, mm. A la like the unforgivable, uh, the, mm. the unbreakable vow, which also doesn't involve blood, but feels like blood magic, mm-hmm. um, like a blood pact just in like general Western fantasy lore, like has these kinds of consequences. So that's the only thing I can think of is that like there is magic in this universe that acts like blood magic, but they don't use blood blood because children yeah. i don't know that's all i got okay well there yeah. we go just yeah, you know I, um wondering. andrew our our uh al- alternate co-host andrew had a really great idea that because we were talking about what if mcgonagall was in charge this whole time i mean obviously the entire series would be so much different but um professor mcgonagall would be like okay yeah let's go to the first task you sit right fucking here and we're gonna run out the time Put on your Cedric Diggory t-shirt and sit right fucking here, (laughs) etc. at length. And everyone just like watches like a sleeping Hungarian horn (laughs) tail. Yeah, and Harry's just like sipping his tea. (laughs) (laughs) Woo, go Cedric. Oh, man. This whole section is very vivid. I really enjoy it. Um. The dragon, the dragons are like palpable. So the the other reason they're angry is because they were given a sleeping draft to get them to here, like for the transport from Romania or similar, because that's where Charlie Weasley works. Question: How do we think they transported them? <laughs> brooms. <laughs> just kidding. Just, just kidding. a series of brooms. Just <laughs> so many brooms. <laughs> That is a great fucking, like, maybe just, like, a classic mm. boat. I don't know. How would you get? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Europe is not most How do you water. transport a sleeping dragon? That sounds like a riddle. How do you transport a sleeping dragon? <laughs> oh, my God. That is, like, Bilbo just, like, running out of riddles, just, like, making <laughs> shit up. Uh, the answer is carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe I'll post that on the Twitter and see what other suggestions what people have. Is, yeah. I, I got kind of nothing, like because I would say, oh, they fireplace. just like somehow apparated with them. Yeah. But if they're going to apparate, then there's no need for a sleeping draft. <laughs> just like a game of tag to like apparate while you're touching <laughs> the <laughs> dragon. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god. Yeah, god. I have no fucking idea. Point is, they're pissed. And, like, wizards don't even drive, so, like, it couldn't even just be on, like, a truck that is run by by Muslim magicians. I love, I love slipping up the word wizards to magicians. (laughs) (laughs) But, like, you, it would have to be, like, a, (laughs) like, a horse-drawn situation. (laughs) See, I'm imagining, like, a Hogwarts Express, but there are, like, just flat cars. And right. then there's just a Steam dragon, power. a sleeping dragon, yeah. like tied onto it. I be- I would buy a train. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be a very European solution. Yes, it sure. would be extremely European. Or maybe there's like a specific way to transport dragons. Like, you know, there's different kinds of magical technology, like a uh, transportation in this book, like the giant Bobaton's carriage and the spooky water pirate ship. So maybe there's something for dragons i don't fucking know i really stumped you with that one (laughs) yeah it's a good one i'm gonna ask twitter twitter usually knows i mean in the movie they just have them in like jurassic park style boxes and it just seems like they airdropped them or something it did seem like they'd airdropped them (laughs) brooms with like a what do they call those like um like a biplane is like the Mm. the newest form of plane technology that wizards can use (laughs) So yeah, there's there's lots of people. The book says men. I'm gonna call them people, people. because not all dragon, dragon doctors trainers are, are men. <laughs> yeah, there are definitely lots of different kinds of people there. Um, so they're running around trying to control the dragons. In the end, uh, it takes several dragon. Te- trainers. I almost said technicians. <laughs> it's, it takes several dragon trainers to, to, to stupefy one dragon, right? It took, it took like, it says seven or eight people per mm-hmm. dragon. I, I mean, it's this is a very good little bit of writing, because we kind of know now, like, what kind of magical 
strength it will take to overcome yes. these dragons. Yeah. It takes approximately like eight times what Harry's like best stupefy could be. Yeah. You know? Also, does he know stupefy at this point? I'm sure he does by the end of this book, but <laughs> who knows what he knows? Fine, <laughs> <laughs> he definitely he knows, knows <laughs> Expelliarmus. Well, and it, th- I mean, you know that the summoning spell is going to come up because the book keeps saying like, oh, wow, Harry's really struggling with that Accio <laughs> spell. And it's like, I don't care. You've never told me about specific spells for more than one sentence before. So that's how you know it's going to be mm-hmm. important because they keep fucking talking about it. So, um... Charlie's here. Hey, baby. The universe's favorite. I'm just going to end there. (laughs) Boy. Technician. Favorite dragon technician. I wonder how hard it would be. Hold on. Let me see. Let me see. I I, I, I ran a poll once. (laughs) No, you go ahead. Um, A reminder to the listeners that it is my headcanon that it's a wizarding euphemism when you say like, oh, he's off in <laughs> Romania with dragons. That's like their way of being like, oh, yeah, he's gay and he's never going to marry a woman. <laughs> I do love that interpretation. It's like, oh, yeah, Charlie. He's with dragons. <laughs> Runs with dragons. Um, I can't find my poll. I, I searched on my Twitter for the words Charlie and fuck. So I'm... I mean, maybe I said sleep with. Like, that's not like me, though. (laughs) Um, I did run a poll of Bill or Charlie. And, like, it's pretty... I mean, I think everyone agrees. Sorry to just always get into this. But, I mean, like, wilderness, dragon boy is, like, (laughs) wow. That's everything. It's the ultimate how to train your dragon. Like, how to train your dragon three when Hiccup is, like, a full adult... Yes. I have not seen the third one, but you should. Oh, you should. <laughs> Wait, it's- does Hiccup get hot? <laughs> I mean, he's always been hot, but like he's definitely like a gangly teenager in the first one. He's such like a John Krasinski. Like he's mm-hmm. just like a floppy good boy. Wow, that is not this series. Um, Charlie Weasley, <laughs> Charlie also a floppy Weasley. good boy. <laughs> He's just so hot. I, I'm so sorry. Um, He's just, like, got a really good attitude. Like, he definitely has the most middle child energy of anyone in the Weasleys, I think. Ron has, like, the shitty antagonistic middle child energy. You know, he's doing it right now. But, like, Charlie has the middle child energy where he's like, yeah, my older brother was great. And then there were, like, five more after me. So, like, I'm just happy if I get dinner. You know, like, he really is just so... Go with the flow and so charming. Yeah, so he's being like very stern with Hagrid about the dragon eggs. He's like, I have them counted. Like, I'm not, we're not fucking playing this game. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't forget that Charlie had to orchestrate <gasps> his friends picking up Norberta. Oh, wait, no. I was going to say, how great would it have been? Wait, was Norbert a boy or a girl? Norberta was is Norberta? her name. Oh, okay. Um, it would have been so great if she was one of the dragons here. Oh, yeah. oh, oh my God, her destiny. Anyway. <laughs> that would have been great. Yeah, so Charlie's like, dude, I'm not bailing you out of another dragon debacle. Dragon so. egg situation. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we learn that the task will involve champions getting past the dragons. And this is where we also learn that Molly's having kittens. <laughs> yeah, right. Molly's having kittens. I love that expression so much. I, I mean, context clues, I know what it means, but like, I've never heard that before. In my I've life. never heard anyone say that in terms of like, oh, she's just like beside herself. She's really like, upset about this situation she's having kittens over yeah Webster's does say that it is a British (laughs) euphemism well there we go (laughs) yeah very British oh my god oh my god the idiom is attributed this is from idiomation.wordpress.com according to the BBC particularly painful pregnancies were thought to be as a result of a witch's curse Mm -hmm. instead of being with child the woman was thought to have kittens inside her clawing to get out ooh Ooh. well then see this is why I'm not gonna have kids what if they're kittens you never know look up 
And now you are going to do it. No. Don't look up um, why were chainsaws invented. Nope. I already know. And we don't need to talk about it. If you can follow the conversation from where we are, where we were to where we are now. So Charlie you can- comes over and is like, yeah, the dragons. Mom's real <laughs> mad about it. And Harry's I'm like, like, not like, okay because you brought up chainsaws. <laughs> yeah. Harry is overwhelmed and late. So he leaves. Yeah. He's like, I don't think Hagrid will miss me. He has like a half hour walk up back to the common room just to stress by himself. Like he's stressed. I mean, what do you, okay, Nick. Yeah. What would <laughs> you do right now? Like what, if you learned you were fighting a dragon, yeah. like what would you, where would you even start? I, I mean, I would probably start by like collapsing into a, a heap on the ground and maybe like, <laughs> you know, doing those slow sit-ups like Squidward and that meme post does. But instead of saying future, future saying dragons. <laughs> dragons. I think Harry would have done that if he wasn't late for a very important Yeah, he's day. like, <laughs> I, I can't stress about this. I have other things to stress about right now. Yeah, he's almost like, well, this is about to become serious, this problem. I gotta go. Yeah. He's like, yeah. I can't. We'll unpack that later, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, he, luckily he has something else to jump onto right now yeah Yeah. it's true man and like they even were like you man i feel sorry for whoever gets that hungarian horntail because it's nasty and it's like well obviously that's also like harry's what a strange chat like that is the chapter of this i mean wait what that is the title (laughs) of this chapter yeah and we don't hungarian horntail and it's and it's very much like a brief mention of this one specific dragon you know and so, obviously, you're going to be like, okay, well, I think this Hungarian horn tail that they're like, yeah, and he's real nasty. He's got some spikes on the end of his tail, too. I feel sorry for the feller who has to fight him. And it's like, well, gee, I wonder who's going to get him. <laughs> little Harry. It's always poor little Harry. Or should I should say her, because they're female dragons. Yes, they are nesting mothers. I just, I hate everything about this. Don't. Don't fuck with a nesting mother. I know. God. Maybe that's why all of the wizard, all of the dragon trainers that were there were men, is because all of the women dragon trainers were like, "This is dumb. I <laughs> oh want my no God. part of this." <laughs> I love that headcanon. They're like, "They're I'm like out." Yeah, you guys can take them. We're we're done. <laughs> we outie five thousand. <laughs> yeah, that's just rude. It's just rude. <laughs> So Harry is uh, stressed and hurrying. Wow, bad combo. This is the kind of thing where your uh, your hoodie pocket gets caught oh. on the doorknob. Oh, you're man. stressed and hurrying, and it like gets you, and you're like, "Oh my god!" You're like, "This is this is it. I'm gonna kill myself." <laughs> this is the worst. This was thing my thirteenth reason. <laughs> terrible but that is literally how it feels or like your headphones you know get caught on something for me you know, like, it's my purse die. strap gets caught on my um uh because the first car i drove was a big suburban um i always put the emergency brake on whenever i parked it and so mm-hmm. i'm just in that habit now and so my purse strap w- when i pull up my emergency brake um it, it like pulls the lever up and my purse strap always get stuck on it and i'm trying to get out of the car and i also have five, you know usually 50 other things in my hands and i'm like ah dude getting into and out of the car for work is one of the most stressful things <laughs> in my life it's like i have my purse why i have my lunchbox i have my bag with my book in it and then it's like i have my water bottle my phone and my keys and it's like i'm trying to like move all this weight sometimes i have a coffee yeah no that coffee's going down <laughs> oh so stressful <sighs> Okay, so he's so stressed. H- Harry's hoodie caught on the doorknob moment is running headfirst into uh, Igor Karkarov. <laughs> Which, what a great name to not suspect him at all as being... <laughs> JK was really like, okay, there's this guy who he was previously a Death Eater, but he's not really much of a concern now. They don't know that yet. We want people to be concerned about him. What should I name him? Also, he's from... Um, Romania or Bul- Bulgaria. Bulgaria. What's and he his has, name? <laughs> he has his goatee also, so he's like visibly evil. <laughs> Igor Karkaroff. Here's the thing: it's like it's not like that. He has a goatee. There's a lot of great goatees out there. It's the it's the Jafar goatee. He yeah. like twists yeah. it little, around his finger. <laughs> a little curl at the end. Yes, it's just a little too much for a good guy. <laughs> 
combined with the name, yeah. Yeah, so um, so <laughs> Harry plays dead in the invisibility cloak, which is same. That's exactly what I would like to be doing right now. So Kargarov, <laughs> I just love, I just love these details. So it it says that Kargarov like seems to think that he has encountered like an animal and starts like looking around at waist height for like a dog or like a bear. <laughs> yeah. So Kargarov is also what we're getting here, going to see the dragons. So it looks like at all, this point, all the champions know what's coming, except Cedric except Diggory. Cedric. Aw, poor The baby. goodest boy. So Harry zips up to the common room. He sits down in front of the fire. Boom. Sirius. There he is. He made it just in the nick of time. Sirius is like, hey, bud, what's up? And it's like one of those situations where like all day long at work, people are like, how are you doing? And you're like, I'm good. And like in the group chat, people are like, how's everyone? And you're like, I'm doing great. And like you're at the bank and the bank teller's like, how are you doing today? And you're like, I'm great. And then your mom calls you and you're and she's like, how are you doing, babe? And you're like, I'm having a really bad time. <laughs> It's even better because he starts to say, he says, like, I'm, and then he's like, so my name got pulled out of the Goblet of Fire, right? And ever since then, my life has been a disaster. Rita Skeeter wrote this terrible scathing review of my life and uh, made up all this stuff about me and Hermione. And she also says that I cry every night over my dad, which isn't true at all, even though I do probably sometimes cry sometimes. And then also at the same time, everyone's being mean to me and there are all these badges and the Col- and the Creevy brothers um, got them stuck. And now they say <laughs> Potter really sucks instead of just Potter sucks. And then Hagrid went on a date and he tried to comb his hair. That was really weird. And then um, I went and saw Dragon so the first task is dragons and and Hermione's trying to liberate the elves and it's not working. <laughs> How are you, Sirius? I can imagine Sirius taking this all in stride until he hears that Hagrid tried to comb his hair and then being like, wait, what? <laughs> He's like, okay, now hang on, back up. <laughs> Hagrid said, what? Wait, how big is this woman? <laughs> Harry does indeed spill all of the tea. So Sirius is like, okay, mm-hmm. here's some context for you. Mm-hmm. Karkarov was a well, no, death eater. Well, hang on. First what? he says, dragons, we can deal with. We'll get to that later. I know. It's like, <laughs> wow, that is real cute of you to say, maybe you should start up front with the dragons instead of the context. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, yeah, fatal mistake here. Um, yeah, so Sirius tells Harry that Karkarov was a death eater who was imprisoned and then released for- uh, He was a snitch. <laughs> yeah, but what's the- He was snitching. Isn't there like okay? Those are both great words, but like, isn't there like a, like a professional word, like a real word, like what's the word? Snitch. Rat- ratting out. <laughs> <not> the- uh... <laughs> hmm. Okay. Let me just hit the thesaurus. For, everyone, um, lo- everyone loves helping. when I stop the show <laughs> to Google something. A betting. Aiding. Aiding. No, a betting. And a betting. <laughs> oh, whatever. It's like um. You know, like legally, it's like you tell me something and then yeah. we let you go. Yeah. Whatever. Like I've plea, never plea been bargain, in prison. Deal. Oh, Maybe. yeah. Yeah. Something like that. That sounds really right. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're saying it so confidently and I'm like, yeah, yes, I, I support you. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's definitely the right linguistic train to get on. So, yeah. Mad-Eye Moody put him in Azkaban. Nice. Um, so that explains the tension. Or does it? Or does it? <laughs> it explains it, even if it's not the explanation, you know? <laughs> um, and then he apparently teaches his students, like, literal dark arts. And I guess no one cares. <laughs> he just does that and people know. What they do there in, in Bulgarian. When your teacher is Igor Karkaroff, I think <laughs> you, Like, imagine your kindergartner comes home from school. My teacher's name is Igor Karkaroff. I think you'd be like, yeah, you're going to learn the dark arts at school today. <laughs> he has a Jafar goatee. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, oh, yeah, he's real evil. What did you learn at your first day in kindergarten? Oh, it's just a spell called a Varkajabra. <laughs> Sirius believes that Mad-Eye Moody's incident um, from before the school year was like a legit incident. And someone was trying to prevent him from coming to Hogwarts. Wow, mm. he is right. Insightful. <laughs> Very insightful. Um, he is righter than he thinks he is. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to see Sirius's reaction at the end of this book. And, you know, ha- maybe Harry talks to him and is like, yeah, Voldemort's back. I watched this guy die. I watched this kid die right before my eyes. I almost died. Um, Mad-Eye Moody was an imposter. And he's like, oh, my God, I knew it. I called it. 
Remember, Harry, when I when I broke into that person's house to come talk to you illicitly in your door? Remember how red I was during the conversation? <laughs> um, Sirius is, talks a little bit about Bertha Jorkins. He makes the connection for us between Bertha Jorkins, a ministry official, having gone missing in Albania. Um, that's Voldemort's last known location. And she had knowledge of the Triwizard Tournament. So he is connecting these and dots in case we have failed to connect them ourselves. She was also real dumb. She was real dumb. Quote, no brains, none at all. <laughs> Unquote. She would have been very easy to learn to a trap. I just, I don't know, man. I don't Why know. was she I know traveling people, alone if she's that I know people dumb? who I went to high school who were exactly like that. <laughs> don't, you just can't travel alone if you're so yeah. dumb, babe. Albania is far. Like maybe go to fucking like Belgium or something. Why Albania though? I don't. I don't know, man. Like I think I think this is when J.K. Rowling was like, I'm gonna pick these funny Eastern European countries <laughs> where like no one of uh, you know where like these are like exotic Romania, Bulgaria, Albania. <laughs> I definitely when I read this when I was a kid, I was like, I confused Albania with. Uh, Armenia is that the one mm. that's in like? Uh, oh, I don't know. The, but those definitely sound like you it's would, in like you the northern Middle East. I don't even know if that's called the Middle East. I don't know. Everyone don't loves know, it girl. when I Google stuff. Um, yeah, northern Middle East is pretty good. Oh yeah, it's in that like uh, it's uh in between. <laughs> this is really hot goss. It's in between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, so it's in that little like. Georgia, oh, Azerbaijan, right. Armenia. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, that's not helpful. Those We're are talking certainly about country names. <laughs> <laughs> they are definitely countries. Albania is on... Oh, Albania, like, looks out on the Adriatic Sea at Italy. Beautiful. Hmm. Yeah, it looks like you could swim <laughs> from... Al- I'm sure you can't, but it looks like you could swim from Albania to Italy. <laughs> yeah, Albania. I confused myself. I was like, wait, what country is it? <laughs> yeah, so basically, Sirius is like... I know how you can do the dragon thing. Don't you worry. Here's a lot of buildup. It's just one simple spell. One don't simple spell use stupefy. You're going to want to use stupefy, but don't <laughs> use that one. All right. What He's you like need to do is. <laughs> but someone's coming. It's like you put in change, you know, for a payphone, and <laughs> it runs out. <laughs> it goes dead, like, right at the moment. Someone's coming. Um, He tells Sirius to go. I would be like, go, but send me a fucking owl immediately. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Or, like, even just, like, it, he's in the Gryffindor common room. It's not like Snape or Karkaroff is coming. Like, it's a kid. Like, I would be like, quickly, what is it? What is it? Like, the risk isn't that high. No. Yeah. Like, what ha- is or it? Or even Sirius just be like, uh, you use the tickling hex. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, you know. <laughs> Tickle that bitch to death. Well, the the um, Hogwarts saying is never tickle oh, a sleeping dragon. Yes. Mm. But maybe you can tickle an awake one. That's yeah. That's the catch. that's the key to all of this. Isn't that adorable? Dumbledore would have given him extra points for style if he had what taken if that. That's actually the way to solve this task, and it's actually very like that's harmless. That's very harmless fun. It's like yeah. So um, you guys all. Like, congratulations, you all got your eggs, you won the task, you finished your live, yay. Um, however, the r- solution you were supposed to use was just tickling a dragon. So, And instead, you all chose violence. <laughs> that would be, like, extremely funny, especially if, since they're, like, eating in the Great Hall every day, like, I don't know if this is true, but, like, probably the Hogwarts crest and motto are, like, on the wall, you know, yeah. just, like, every day. <laughs> and Dumbledore's just like, it was literally right in front of you <laughs> and none of you <laughs> picked up on that but then someone is like spe- it specifically says not to tickle them when they're sleeping so that is misleading <laughs> <laughs> um so series goes he doesn't tell us anything um the person who was coming was ron so like that sucks dude because like even if they're fighting ron would have been like oh that's serious this is a serious moment okay mm. boo um, but it is, though. Leave, leave the podcast. <laughs> I, this is my resignation. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so Harry is... I think every other moment of this fight between Ron and Harry is Ron's fault. This this one is... This one's Harry's fault. <laughs> but it's warranted, though. I totally get it. Of Like, right. when you're just mad at someone and you're like, I'm just going to continue being mad at you. <laughs> 
Right. Huh. Um, he's feeling a little tender and sensitive right now, and he lashes out at Ron physically. I love... This is one of two times where they get physical <laughs> with each other. <laughs> This one is, like, better than the one that happens in Deathly Hallows where they have their, like, bitch fight. <laughs> yeah, Harry chucks a Potter Stink badge at Ron and it hits him square in the forehead. <laughs> and the worst part is that Ron doesn't react. No, the and the best part is what <laughs> Harry says, which is, now you might have, there, now you might get a scar. Ho- like, hope you're happy. Isn't that what you've always wanted? Right. And then he storms off and it mentions that, like, Harry wanted Ron to punch him. <laughs> like, he, <laughs> he Harry wants just wants to, to watch the whole burn. Oh, man. And it's probably frustrating that, like, for once, Ron is, like, <laughs> shocked. He's like, yeah, what? Are you okay, bud? Um, yeah, I don't feel this way anymore, but definitely when I was. 14, I could be found antagonizing friends into fighting with me. Um, Or, like, intentionally taking steps to make fights go longer. When I was a freshman, or maybe, like, a sophomore in college, I remember I got into, like, a very dumb fight with my roommate. She was, like, running late for class, and, like, I said something cunty. She was like, I'm not going. I can't be late on the first day of class. And I said something extremely cunty, like, next time, don't be late. Like, I said something like that. Like, just... (laughs) Well, fuck you, bitch, you know? And, like, we got into, like, a very long fight, and she she got, like, I think, extra mad. I don't really remember. But eventually she came to me and apologized. She came to me and apologized. There must be more that I'm not remembering. And I remember looking her in the eyes and saying, I'm not ready to forgive you yet. <laughs> wow. And that's when I was, like, 19. So wow. definitely at 14... These choices make sense to me. I've come a long way. Hey, I've come a long way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm the one who says sorry now, to be clear. <laughs> well, I mean, that's why that's why Hermione is so frustrated with them throughout the chapter, right? Like, she knows yes. that it's just a matter of their lacking the emotional maturity, so. Yeah, it's extremely frustrating. Because, like, this is the kind of argument. I, and then, I don't know about y'all, but, like, I feel like everyone's been in a moment like this where it's, like, you're so mad that, like, even though you logically see a way out of the situation, like your emotions don't let it happen. Mm -hmm. And honestly, not to be this person, but like that is something really excellent that weed has done for me. Right. Cause I have like such an emotional reaction to stuff. And like, I definitely get to a point in fights where I'm like, I objectively want to make up, but like, I just feel bad in my heart and it's like, not going to come out right. Smoke a little bit of weed best apology of my life after that you know (laughs) just like so heartfelt i'm so ready to make nice so it's hard it's hard when your feelings are making you all Mm -hmm. mad yeah harry storms upstairs to bed and he lays there steaming for a long time but ron never comes back where's ron right now where'd he go i don't know he slept on the couch in the common i think he might have yeah (laughs) just like which it makes them even more like in a relationship of like (laughs) You're not coming up to bed tonight. You're going to sleep on the couch. Oh, that is probably like so snuggly, though. Like the nice common room mm-hmm. couch in front of the fire. That's probably like the best spot. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's the end of the chapter. Nick, is there anything that we like didn't get to talk about or any themes you wanted to drive home or like last thoughts? Um, I mean, as far as last thoughts go, like... <sighs> I gotta say that coming back to this book and uh, rereading it now, after uh, after studying English academically for six years and all that sort of stuff, yeah, it's it's constructed well, but it's not written well. If yeah. that makes sense, I mean, I'm, I'm Dude, sure this I'm not. This is a Harry Potter slander podcast. You can say whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm sure I'm not. I'm not bringing some great revelation down from the the heavens or anything, saying that. But like. It just really, it really hit me that like, it's possible to have a best-selling book that isn't well written, which is. Oh my god! I think it's like, I think it's like easier to have a best-selling book that's not that's well written. Yeah, like, for example, you know what's really well written? Lord of the Rings. Okay. You know what's (laughs) written a little too well? (laughs) Almost impossible to read. Lord of the Rings. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, we call that dense. Yes. So, 
Yes, definitely. Yeah, it is. I mean, it just really goes to show how formative the literature you encounter in your youth and in your, you know, sort of like literary development phases mm-hmm. can be. Um, because I first read this book series when I was quite young. I started it when I when I was eight and it served such an important role in my literary development. It, it, it pa- basically turned me into a reader like this series pretty much yeah. single handedly turned me into a reader. And like that importance is not diminished by my by you know in our adulthood being Mm -hmm. like i would have made different choices (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah but i mean like the way that it's arranged is really ingenious how like the the opening of the chapter has that kind of anxiety montage because like it really puts you into harry's emotional state you like you can relate to the character already if you're a teenager a nerdy guy or whatever nerdy person but like It just makes it all the more visceral that you're like just hit with thing after thing after thing and like the first maybe five six pages of the chapter and it like also does that weird thing to your sense of time like what harry mentions so oh we lost mary clay christina if you're still editing this episode oh there goes zoom zoom crashed christina editing christina if you're still editing this hi hope you're doing well Wow. Okay, so she obviously didn't have any final thoughts. No. <laughs> oh my god, it's a puppy. Ethan just sent me a video of a puppy. His puppy. But um, I guess we'll see if she comes back before we moved on to wrapping it up. Mm-hmm. Editing Christina, I hope you are enjoying this. Okay, let's see if I can try join joining the the meeting again. Oh no, that was definitely my internet. Yeah, my internet. That's that's a bummer. Um, let me see. I'm gonna text you real fast. All right, let me text you, Christina. I'm still rolling. Don't you worry. Oh, she and I texted each other at the same time. Oh. She says we can end the episode without her. Wow. Okay. Whoa. Super organic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Mary Clay's gone forever. Yeah. She has fallen. Um, wait, what is it? It's like she's fallen out of time and space. Um, whatever Gandalf says when he comes back. She's fighting a Balrog somewhere. She'll, she'll yeah. be fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess Mary Clay doesn't have any final thoughts, and I don't either. Um, so, Nick, do you want to tell people um, like where they can find you on the internet? What kind of projects you're working mm-hmm. on? Sure. Uh, You can find me. I'm not super active on Twitter these days, but you can find me over on Twitter at Nick S C Zach. I'm also on Instagram with the same handle. Again, not super active there, but I'll post now and then projects these days. I am, I'm doing a little bit of self publishing. I've, uh, I've only done the really literary stuff so far. So, um, way kind of more of a passion project thing than, anything cool. super commercial but like still there's a translation of beowulf up there there's like a an expat fiction novel that i wrote about when i was teaching and well, inspired by uh my time teaching in south korea it's both of those that's are awesome. are on amazon yeah yeah that's so cool i'll link those both in the show notes um i'll, I'll get them from you via yeah. email yep yeah. yeah i can do that's so cool and um, have you been watching, reading, playing anything um, recently that you think our listeners might enjoy? Uh, actually, yes, I have been. Um, I've been playing this game called, well, not recently, but like within the last uh, month or so. I was really into this game called Heaven's Vault. Oh. It's on Steam and it's on the Switch. I'm not sure about PlayStation and an Xbox, but it's really good. It's like this... Um, it's sort of like a cross between the Phoenix Wright games, like that sort of visual novel sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But also, um, it's really heavily sci-fi. There's some exploration involved. Uh, there's like a time loop involved where you it. The game itself encourages you to play it <laughs> multiple times to sort of really cool. fully flesh out the story. One of the central mechanics is translating this ancient language. And you you keep your dictionary of words with each playthrough, so like you learn more words as you go. Cool, that is so freaking cool. I'm looking at just like the art right now. Is it's so really lovely. yeah yeah. It looks incredible. It's a great game. I'm definitely gonna check this out. I've been in um, 
a gaming slump this okay. year. That's what I've been because um, I've just been so busy. So my New Year's resolution in 2022 is literally to play more video games. Hey. <laughs> um, so I started back up with The Witcher 3 because that's just like pretty easy to get into. Um, but I'm definitely going to check this out because this is beautiful and I love my Switch. It's a great it's a great little system. Yeah. So Mary Clay's gone forever, but you know that you can listen to her podcast. Uh, Christina, you can put this in later in post, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, you can find me. I'll do my. Th- <laughs> it's really funny doing an outro without prompting from you. You can find me on my podcast. That's what I'm talking about. Um, and in the new year, the first episode is about the Lord of the Rings musical. I believe that episode has just come out and it was actually a very enjoyable experience. Um, I would for sure recommend uh, diving into some of the the clips on YouTube because it's a very, the the show is like quite a spectacle of theatrics, really. Um, And I don't really have much to plug. Oh, I'll plug the new season of Witcher. Oh my God, The Witcher, season two. I was like, oh, finally, The Witcher's here. I'm going to you know, take my time. I'm going to really appreciate it. Done in two days. And I want season three already. It was just great. It was pure, like, like, okay, we know Geralt, like, mm, daddy, but like, no, he was literally like, ooh, daddy Geralt. Um, love it. A hundred percent watch it. If you haven't watched The Witcher before, um, I think now is an even better time to watch it because you can launch right into season two. She's covering... <laughs> Uh, the etc. right now. I think the last thing she covered was Lord of the Beans, the uh, VeggieTales adaptation. So (laughs) um, definitely check it out because it's getting extremely silly and awesome. (laughs) Um, You know where to find me on the internet. Everything's linked in the show notes. And I'm going to recommend that everyone read Panic, Panic, Panic. I'm going to recommend that everyone read She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan. It is like a loose adaptation of the Mulan myth. And it is Mm. just like a very beautiful, poignant, just incredibly dope like feminist book um that everyone should read yeah yeah it's incredibly cool unlike anything i've ever read before so nick thank you so much for joining us it's been an absolute pleasure to have you oh thanks for inviting me on it's been great it's good to get, get back into the old podcasting every now and then yes and mary clay texted me and said tell nick i said it was nice having home on so oh. i i think she means him we're not sure so. we'll never know you well. know never too late there's no way to know no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but thank you so much for your time and your perspective we really appreciate it well so i'm glad to help out yeah all right gang i gotta go finish reading turn up the heat dragon wrangling for beginners before this book starts weeping bye The Restricted Section is a member of the Movie Night Crew Network, which features other amazing podcasts such as its namesake, The Movie Night Crew, which is an extra chaotic podcast featuring the gang just shooting the shit about whatever movie they just watched. Alrighty. It's movie night. Grab your popcorn. Grab your coffee. Grab your friend. Grab a cat. And let's go. Who directed this? What year did it come out? Is that that girl from that show? Who wrote this? Where's the cat? Who would you rather bang? Pass the popcorn. Does this pass the Bechdel test? What about the Steve Buscemi test? Does a woman literally speak in this movie? Oh my god, a dog. This reminds me of in Harry Potter when... Are we recording? What do the critics say? It's a guilty pleasure. What's your rating? Can you be quiet? Oh my god. Movie night crew. It's just like watching movies with your friends. And then arguing about it after. Every Sunday, wherever you get podcasts. The Restricted Section was created by me, Christina Kahn, based on the book series by J.K. Rowling. All music by Ryan Kahn. Logo by Michael Hardison. Support us on patreon.com slash restricted section. 
For as little as a dollar a month, you can gain access to our Discord community server, which is a really happy place to be. And there are other rewards as well, such as bonus episodes and Zoom happy hour hangouts. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Restricted Section Pod, on Twitter at Restricted Pod, and on Facebook at Restricted Section Pod. Also, feel free to shoot us an email at restrictedsectionpod at gmail.com to share your thoughts, feelings, complaints, conspiracy theories, or even lavish praise. Um, all right, that's that's it for me. Bye, Christina. Sorry my internet went out. That movie sucked. I kind of liked it. Movie Night Crew Network.